Hello. I'm Courtney J. Martin, the Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the DIA Art Foundation. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our first DIA Talk of 2018. It is a pleasure to be hosting a conversation between Eva Lambois and Benjamin Buclo on the subject of Francois Morellet's exhibition at the DIA Art Foundation. Today's conversation is a part of the Sackler Institute at DIA, and it is made possible by support from Lisa and Tom Blumenthal and the New York State Council on the Arts. This exhibition is the first in-depth examination of Morellet's career in the United States in more than 30 years. In tandem with the exhibition, Morellet's landmark 1971 mural is on the west facade of this building and visible from 22nd Street. In Beacon, Morellet's large-scale neon installation, No End Neon, is on long-term view. I invite you to see all of them when you have a chance. If you have not seen the Morellet exhibition downstairs, it will be open today until 6 p.m. It is my great pleasure to welcome Professors Bois and Buclo to Dia Chelsea. Bois is a professor of art history in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. In the 1990s, Bois' painting as model set a formative example of modernist critical discourse for entire generation. As a noted curator, he has worked with many artists and is the author of the Ellsworth Kelly catalog resume. Bois knew Morellet and has written about him, most recently in the 2016 October anthology of Morellet's writings. Benjamin Buclo is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Modern Art at Harvard University. Buclo came to prominence in the 1970s as the editor of Interfunctionen, one of the most important post-war European art magazines. In both neo-avant-garde and culture industry, essays on European and American art from 1955 to 1975, and formalism as historicity, models and methods in 20th century art, Buclo advanced an interconnected account of the key issues of 20th century American and European artistic practice. He has written about artists Gerhard Richter and Thomas Hirschhorn for DIA. We invited Bois and Buclo today because of their frequent collaborations. They are both editors of the journal October and co-editors of Art Since 1900, Modernism, Anti-Modernism, Postmodernism, first published in 2004. Today's conversation will be moderated by Beatrice Gross, adjunct curator of Francois Morellet. Please join me in welcoming Eva Lam, Benjamin, and Beatrice. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you all for joining us today. I must say we're extremely excited to be about to hear some of the thoughts and ideas from Eva Lam and Benjamin about Francois Morlet, who's so far, um, if not unknown, barely known in the United States. But before that, I had a few thank yous of my own. I wanted to acknowledge the tremendous work done by the staff here at DIA, and especially Megan Whitco. Where are you? Thank you so much, Lucy and Roxanne. Um, I also wanted to say that none of this uh, would be happening uh, with Jessica Morgan, who's at the initiative, the director here at DIA's initiative of the exhibition of everything else that is related to it. Thank you so much. And finally, last but not least, of course, the Morlaix estate. Um, they are based in Cholet, in France, in Vendée, and that's actually a location we should keep in mind because we may come back to it. It might be a topic. Uh, they regret not being here today, but they were very thrilled. But Florent, one of the sons, who is a celebrated and longtime New Yorker, is here. Thank you so much for being with us today, Florent. Um, the collaboration has been so gracious, ongoing. We couldn't do any of this. And we're also creating a hope of bringing our new voice to a scholarship that hasn't happened so far. So thank you. Thank you for that. Francois was really a pioneer of conceptual art, but of a Dadaist kind. I think he always 
developed an approach that was both very ambitious in redefining geometric abstraction, but also bringing a certain sense of humor, or to quote uh, François Morlet, frivolity to it, a certain levity. Um, as a person, he really was running away from honors. But I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure he would be honored to be celebrated here tonight and perhaps a little amused. So we'll try to also keep it perhaps a little funny, at least light and well. rigorous <laughs> at the same time. I'd like to start the conversation with actually another quote of the artist. Um, in 1987, he was asked, you know, as sometimes in museums or catalogs, one people ask an artist, okay, so what's your work about? Two sentences. He thought the request was a little fresh, but he played the game, he played along, and he said, okay, so if I look back at my 35, 35 year career at the time, I'll declare myself the freak child of Mondrian and Picabia, <laughs> if you go, you know. And then he went on, um, just as serious and humorous, saying that his oeuvre was just as rigorous as absurd. And this is how I would like us maybe to uh, start the conversation, to discuss this paradoxical quality of um, François Mollet's work, and maybe look at some of his earliest works of maturity, dating, dating from year 1952, and see how his main goal was to eradicate personal taste, composition, and meaning even. So we might want to look at the first few images, maybe image three, and then image four. 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 Let's start with four. What do you think, Ivana? Well, it's my, one of my fairest works. Um, uh, we have several reasons for that, but one of them is a text that Morley wrote, I, I can't remember, when it, it, it's published in the, in the October anthology, but I think it was in, in the 70s or even 80s for the journal Quad, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and it's the text itself is is a tour de force of of his own humor. It's, it's all our uh, the, the title is something that our need to publish. That I could not uh, write an article. About oh one. yeah, yeah, something. He did oh, write one, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's all about the impossibility of reproducing this work, and gives all kinds of different different models of how to do it, and how, how everything would be missed, and and then he has this extraordinary. He said, okay, fine, I found a solution to do it, and that's where I'm going to, it's not exactly the way the, the work is, but he will give a good idea. And then he, decide, he starts, he, he, he makes a kind of count of the amount of decisions that he had to make to produce this object. And so there are two decisions for the square, which is a dimension, and the, well, you know, he just he gives all the kind of decisions that it ended up being 11 decisions. So 11 decisions To, work. Pr pr to produce that, and it's typical of, the, you know, is, in a way, it's a kind of mockery of the whole idea of, of the subjectivity of the artist, because in order to produce that, you need to decide 11, 11 things, you know, the number of lines, uh, the width of the line, the, the black and white, that's two decisions, you know, and uh, this is, uh, and in, on the other hand, it's also extremely rigorous in, in his own, he applies the system, Oh, I will divide a square into uh, whatever number of squares. Uh, the, 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 the system is decided in advance, but it shows that there's a kind of absurdity, a kind of impossibility to eradicate subjectivity. And he, he, he does that in a very you know, funny way. But I, in the meantime, yeah, exactly as you say. Very. Can I add something to this? Because when I read the text again, I was very puzzled because it sounded so familiar, even though it's completely original. And I only realized after a little while, there are two dimensions that it reminds me of. First, of the one Duchamp that Morellet never refers to, peculiarly enough, because it's such a crucial work and you know what's coming, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is to point to the performative dimension of the construction of an abstract representation in the trois de page etalon. Right? So there's an exact description of what does it take to produce and to construct this peculiar looking object. The other dimension that it reminds me of is of course Solowit instantly, who also talks about the performative dimension that have to be incorporated in the construction and the definition of the work. So once again, he's quite clearly partaking in an incredibly important historical transformation of bringing 
performative processual operations within the representation and the discussion of the representation itself, which is clearly completely independent at the same time. Yes, yes. But, but the idea of being, you know, this idea of being uh, here, you, you said Mondrian and Picabia partly because I suppose he thought that the irony of Duchamp was a little too castrating and Picabia a bit less, uh, less so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Even more, <laughs> even more difficult. More difficult. <laughs> well, yeah, Picabia, to a point that he came back to that reference in the 90s and started a series entitled Relash, okay. yeah. as a nod to Picabia, but also a way to comment upon his own revisiting of geometric abstraction, okay. saying, I'm loosening my own systematic approach. Okay. Also, unless I'm mistaken, I think that his, his interest in Duchamp is fairly it, it's later. He, come, he had a fairly early on rather, you know, he was rather distanced from Duchamp, and you can see in his text, and he's a text that he wrote, you know, oh, finally, yes, I like this guy, yeah. But uh, it, took, it took him a while, I think. Well, for PKB, it was more immediate. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but this, this capacity, I mean, he had, the, he had this, um, this desire right from the beginning to find ways of not having to compose and not having to, and having eliminate as, po as much as possible the, the subjectivity. And, uh, if we go back to Relash, I think, um, to kind of follow up on what you yeah. just said, that's a perfect example to see one of the systems where you adopted an um, heterogeneous factor using chance so that he won't have himself to make decisions, subjective decisions. The way Relash, this, and this is a series, is organized, it is, as you can see, a multiplicity of right angles in different materials that are placed very specifically onto the canvas through a, system. through a system. It's a numeral system that is derived once again from, well actually in this case, the phone numbers from his local phone directory from Manelois, which he started using back in the 50s when he first adopted chance as an organizing factor. The story with, with Relache is that he felt that he wanted to create a work that would be almost like a compendium or an encyclopedia of all the different materials that he had adopted so far and use right angles in all those different materials. It's like his palette or his toolbox, really. I, and they yeah. I, I remember when I saw works yeah, of this, one. some of the, the, col the colored one, and maybe other related works in his studio around that time, mm -hmm. uh, he was doing them. So. Um, that one thing that he was adding, he was very proud that he had basically, he said, I cracked the code of a Frank Stella. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing Frank Stella with a system. You don't need to be an artist to do this stuff. <laughs> you know, without making any mystery about it, yeah. when he first made that series, he wanted people to really know, not just believe, but know that the system was random and not subjective. He had a public notary make an official statement and analysis of how the series functioned. And the very first time he exhibited this Relash series, which was all variations of colors, he had the um, constat d'huissier, so the official statement by... Not a republic. Not, not a republic, that explained step by step how the system functioned, and alongside with it, a Xerox copy of the page in a phone directory, where the numbers used for the placement of those different elements appeared. Well, one of the things that, uh, when I chose the essays to be translated in this issue of October, one of the things which, which was difficult is that many of, he, he, wrote, he wrote more in, in the later part of his life, and many of his essays are really introductions to shows and are like uh, recipes or, or yes, like Julia Child. And in order to do that, you, every single show had, had this little, uh, explanation of the system and of the parameters of the system and all that. So it's very hard to choose text like that because you know, once you don't have the show, you, you, know, you, would, you would need a huge amount of illustrations to, to make sense to a, an audience that had no idea who, who François Morellet was. But this was very important for him, that there was no mystery, that everything would be laid out, that there was a reason, and, a, and even though the systems themselves could be arbitrary, the arbitrariness would be and highlighted, 
So let's say I, for the number four, there will be, the angle will be in blue. For the number five, it will be in red. It's all there. You all have the caption. And that was very important for him. And it was always very striking to me ever since you know, I met him. When we were discussing, Ivan and I, to prepare this a little bit just a f half an hour ago, I said, um, um, I said, you good you will be the good cop and I will be the bad cop. And he said, no, we don't make it that simple. But I think I will play the bad cop for a while. And I will ask the question, don't we have to bring into the conversation that chance operations and systems theory are aging in the 20th century as well, that they're not stable historical entities that we can refer to perpetually from Duchamp in 1913 to Morellet in 1962 or 1992? Don't we have to recognize that the very idea of a self-propelling chance operation in and of itself is historically overdetermined, and what are the factors that make that historical overdetermination differ in time? Wouldn't that be interesting to figure out a little bit? Well, I think you know how to determine that because there is a precedent and a source of the reason why Morellet chose to use chance as a factor, and that is through Elwer Skelly and then yeah, back. Right. Yeah. In the same way that we say monochromy has age, or monochromy yeah, yeah, yeah. has yeah, but it, just, but it, Okay, but there's, so when Morley uh, gets into chance, that's in the early 50s, and it's after, and he's very clear about it, after having become friends and Kelly. for <laughs> Kelly, and Kelly, it's not directly, it's not by looking at works of Kelly, it's no. by Kelly telling him about his visit to Arp. Kelly had visited three times on and Harp. And well, she was not there, but you know, and uh, but yeah, he, Kelly was speaking about the works made by the famous duo collage made by by Arp and Sophie Tabor, and speaking about his visit to Arp and about his chance. And that's that thing at a time where Morellet was still completely under the the you know impact of Max Beale and all that. Chance is something that Max Beale, Max Beale system couldn't handle. So that was you know in a way for him, a way to take distance from, from the tradition of rationalist abstraction and, and all that. Concrete but, art. yeah, and concrete art, but, but um, you know, yeah, there was Duchamp and there was Dada, and, and, but then it's true that after the, the you could say the, 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 the censorship of Dada by surrealism, chance operation had completely gone out of, out of the window, after, and it's, it's only, you know, and after the white came back, Cage didn't do chance yet. It's only a few years later. So, you know, chance was. Huh? Chance Kelly and Morellet was around 52, 53. Kelly is 51, uh, um, Morellet 53, 54, and, and, and Cage. Cage, Cage, Cage just. It's, 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 Cage visits Kelly in Palace. Yeah. Yeah, but he was not doing chance yet. In fact, you could say that Cage was influenced, if you like to word influence, which I don't, by Kelly. Uh, you know, he was not doing chance yet when he met Kelly. Not at all. Uh, so the chance had been basically kind of repressed, uh, bizarrely, uh, by the war or by the all this period. And I think surrealism, because it's it completely misunderstood the notion of chance and had, had, a, had a role to play in that. Recoded it. You can't misunderstand chance. <coughs> can't it well, it yeah, it it it's super, super determined by the in, by the unconscious and all that, which is not was not what Duchamp had done at all. But I think that there is a yeah, there is a revival, post-war revival, and this post-war revival of chance is the same as a revival of other things like the monochrome or this or that, which are all systems to try to eradicate subjectivity because subjectivity had given Hiroshima and uh, you know the and and uh, and the Holocaust basically. That's what the, that was a, that was a post-war context. And, and this reaction, if we were to see it or qualify it in terms of art history rather than more general world events, um, don't you think maybe Morley was reacting also very radically against um, lyrical abstraction, for instance, or art informel? Of course, of course. Yeah. And, because, that, and of course, and that was this was you know, I mean, you could you could have an interpreted or some people did the lyrical abstraction or the informel or as chance, but of course it was not chance. I mean, it was, it was chance that was not, it was chance that was not uh, theorized as, as chance. It was, he's uh, normally very polite and gentle, but when it comes to Mathieu, he becomes very vociferous, right? That's good, yeah. So yeah. that's where it 
becomes clear that that's not acceptable to him. No, no, no. Well, he, he was also gross, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a royalist, right wing, you know, showman. Oh, come on. But there's almost something, not to be provocative myself, but reactionary in Morlaix. I believe that he several times repeated that he only adopted this certain form of geometric abstraction because he was reacting against something else. And how did he born, be born in a different period? He, he might have been just being, reacting against, yet again, another movement. Or Yeah, that's, that's actually, we were discussing with Benjamin in the five minutes to prepare. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, it's interesting to see there's always this comparison made between American artists and, and, and Morley and all that. And Morley himself was often, you know, tempted to, to you know, he looks like Lewitt and he looks like so, you know. And all this, all this war of, of I did it first and whatever, which I always felt. We could perhaps look at the double uh, Yeah, we could. Yeah, and I always, you know, felt it was uh, silly. And I remember I told him, just as I told Elsa Kelly for the same reason, the precursors don't exist. It's like, it's a, the worst way of, of speaking about anyone is to say he's a precursor or she's a precursor of that. Would you want to be, would your goal in life to be a precursor? No, I mean, it's absurd. It's, a, it's an anachronical construct. It's, a, it's conceptually, it's a, wrong, it's a wrong concept. It doesn't work. But what's interesting is when you make differentiations about you know, different people is that you look at what indeed they react to. And Morale and Saul Lewitt, because that's a famous comparison, that's, that's the one I, I wrote about, um, and it led to this huge polemic in flash art and all that. Um, Morale was reacting against, certainly, the, the lyrical, lyrical abstractions and other things. Uh, L'Ecole de Paris, the post-cubist stuff and all that, and he was, and, and uh, Saul Lewitt was not reacting against that, he was reacting against expression, but also pop yes, and you know, whatever, memory. different things. It was not the same, it's not, it was, and Morelli was, was a product in a way, a transformative product of, of uh, geometric abstraction, which Lewitt was not at all, it was, uh, you know, so it's interesting to see the, the you know, what, how the flavor, even though sometimes it's very similar, how the flavor of things differ because of the context completely. Although, wouldn't you say that they both, Saul Lewitt and François Morlet, shared a quite similar interest in uh, Russian avant-garde? Yes. I know they both yes. looked a lot at con constructivism. Yes, and yes. And probably Morlet saw more than, than Lewitt uh, of that, because there was more availability. I have a little list of dates, which I think is interesting, since you said precursors are not the issue. Of course, I'm not saying that they are, but it's interesting to see Rauschenberg was born in 25, Morlet was born in 26. Uh, Alan Capra was born in 27, and then we have the Anus Mirabilis of 1928, when you have Solowit, Donald Judd, Andy Warhol, and Yves Klein all being born in 1928. And I think it's not a question of precursor, but it's a question of what are the positions that are formulated by that generation, which is quite remarkable how they differ. And one could, for example, advance a provocative proposition, which I'm doing here, what to say, Yves Klein is the figure who spectacularizes the monochrome. Morellet is the figure who subjects the grid and the logical systems of the avant-garde to advanced forms of anticipating extreme practices of total administrative order. Right? So these are the extreme historical epistemes between which artists in the 1950s who reposition themselves in relationship to avant-garde models are defined whether they want this or not. So it's not the same to make a grid in 1952 as it is, I, mean, I don't have to say this, but just emphasize that there is no continuity. There's much more of a rupture than a continuity, I would say. Between the original historical avant-garde and the second post-war avant-garde practices. So when you show the grid, the 1953 work, which you just showed, it has to be recognized as being operative under completely different historical circumstances. That it's not the logic of Mondrian that is performed here, but it's, oh, no, it's, it's, right? it's the logic of a completely different historical order, which is also in its tautological vac vacuity, lacking the utopian dimension that Mondrian had articulated. 
Except that this is atopian and not utopian, right? Except that I think that with regard to that, um, <clears throat> at that time, and even until a bit later, Morellet still had the utopian uh, avant-garde. Uh, later not. Later he was much more, I, I wouldn't say cynical, but uh, much more, let's say, more, you know, les révolutions, ça vient, ça passe. So yeah, but, there, yeah, I think so then. The yeah. was through the 60s. Through the 60s, yeah. Right? Yeah. And after 68, uh, you know, uh, you know he, that was that was it. But I think uh, I think that the beginning of the grave, you know, which which ends in, uh, at the moment of the Vénil Binas, yeah, no, the no, group de recherche d'art visuel, yeah, it was a group, and, and it, it collapsed uh, when uh, one of the members of the group got the prize at the, at the Venice Biennale, and the, the group dissociated completely. But the Grave had some kind of like, when you read of them today, they are almost hilarious. You know, like Marxist slogans about the revolution. And, you know. But don't you think they disbanded also because, well, May 68 happened, and they had devised interventions and happenings in the streets, yeah. and then we're like, oh, well, the streets are doing it for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he says. You know. there was, and were, the streets were doing that, were doing that better, yeah, he said. They did like, it better. better, so... Yeah. Yeah. But I think, that the, I think that for quite a while he still had... And you could even say that even Max Beer, for um, all the problems, still had this idea of a, of a utopian, uh, you know, future paradise and all that. That disappears. But I think for Morel a little bit later. I think at the beginning he was probably not completely aware of the the extremely critical dimension of his anti-subjective yeah. discourse. Well, that would be also a way to distinguish Tolomé from Morel. Yeah. So different same. generation, maybe Morelle also. It comes out of the Latin American tradition via Max Bill. And of course, the Latin American tradition of abstraction and art concrete is, in a strange way, out of touch with history because they really establish the continuity of pre war and post war utopian practices in abstraction, which in Europe was completely impossible. So they bring that back to Europe, and Bill is the key link figure, and Morelle follows that to some extent, whereas Solo Witt comes out of a completely different trajectory. Yes, he reads Camilla Gray in 1962. Yes, they look at the Russian mo model, but they look at this already th mediated through their distanciation from American abstract expressionism and their distanciation from pop art, right? For them, pop art was the enemy to be overcome in many ways. It was not an attempt to establish a continuity with Russian avant-garde models or abstraction or systemic models in that positive utopian coded sense, right? Mm -hmm. But don't you think that with Saul Lewitt, the his understanding of seriality also played a huge role? And the fact that the chronophotography by Muybridge was such a trigger yes. via Flavin, which is a rather interesting right. path, uh, m gave him a more investigative or narrative approach to his first modular works in 64. But it was a seriality that was not aiming towards radical equality, for example. It was a seriality that was much I'm more sure aiming for, okay, it was much more aiming at the model of self-defeating purposes of meaning production in the sense that Solowit was an avid reader of Beckett, and that was the model that for him Morley was crucial. Morley as well. Morley was okay. obsessed by meaninglessness, okay. by the fact that he could do... And Beckett too. And he Beckett. was familiar with Beckett, and he was obsessed with next to nothingness, presque rien but it's still something. And he actually, that's where he liked to quote a stand-up comedian for our French compatriots, Raymond De Vos, a reference, mm. and saying, Raymond, Raymond De Vos, De Vos. I don't know. <laughs> no, he I'll send Godard. you videos. He's, he's uh, the character in, the, in uh, Pierre Olfou, in, in the, you know, the, the guy who uh, okay. speaks. That's the most highbrow reference you could have on Raymond De Vos, because really it's much more mainstream than this. And he, François Morlet often quotes De Vos saying, well, I really have nothing to say, but it's so hard to say it. Like, it's so hard to let it known that I have nothing to say. Yeah, but that's what John Cage said, too. And Lewitt, in I a sense, as well. I, I, I have nothing to say, and I'm saying it. Yeah. Right? Except I think Morley was not familiar with Cage yet. No, no, no. no, no. no much, much later. Maybe um, if... Uh, one last thing about this work, because also it, it is really a masterpiece that has become a matrix for Morley's work in general. One of the also triggering influence, again, not the only one, and we all know that the notion of influence is a detestable notion, but what happened is the year before, in 1952, 
Morley starts his mature production based on seriality, thinking of basing his work on systems, but not quite there yet. He goes to Granada, south of Spain, and visits the palace of the Alhambra, and is incredibly impressed. It's, I think, truly an epiphany of finding work that is based on the repetition of motif, the variation of negative and positive, and the anonymity of the maker. And that was one of the most instrumental influences for Morellet in the becoming of serial systems. Yeah, that's true. I like to, can we have the image 23? Because I want to sh make also a little characteristic difference between Morellet and, and other artists. One of the things that I always find extraordinary with him is that he <clears throat> um, produces things which are very, Look, look quite complex by unbelievably simple means. So for example, if you didn't know this little diagram that you have here, that's, that's only the top, the top part, to, to, uh, you know, to, to explain this painting, you really don't, you can't really see it very easily that it's made by simply juxtaposition of two grids. And it does happen, this happens always, uh, very often with, in Morales' work, the systems are elementary and it's how to produce complete surprise out of total repetition and you know yeah simplicity and i think that is that is very different from the american from the what lewitt is doing in fact it's almost contradictory on that point to that level um, and that's something that i think he was very proud of that a slightest displacement can produce something that is completely um, expected yeah. yeah. maybe we could look at image 17 because I think it, it does combine that very idea that we mentioned earlier of random, but also extreme complexity visually and incredibly simple system. We have here a random distribution of 40,000 squares using the even and odd numbers of a telephone directory. Oh, but by the way, Jacques, glad that you uh, underlined the titles. All the titles are very explanatory. The last one was, I don't know, tiré, you know, it Some gives the angles, yeah. it gives the angles, and that's it, that's all you need. And here you just know, you have like a, you know, even and, and odd numbers of the telephone, and that's it's all the, the, the parameters are, are given in the title, which is quite an amazing, uh, which you have also in the wit in some of the wall, wall paintings. Before, but, but what uh, happened really is they had the square divided into 40,000 smaller squares with his wife and eldest, eldest son at the time, coming back from work because for the first 20 years of his career, he was working in the family business. So painting in the evening over the weekend. And so his wife or son would read out loud the numbers from the phone directory, just the last digits. And- I was wondering about that, which digits were they reading, the last ones? Yeah, the last ones. And if they were odd or even, they would be a cross or left blank. And then depending on that random distribution, he would paint it one color or the next. And that was to him really a random study of two colors clashing. And you look at it and you, it's impossible to figure out what the system is and you do read the title. And so he was, I think also one of his main goals was to never mystify people. He was actually wanting to demystify. Sorry. He was, uh, in fact, in his, uh, in his slight kind of polemic, or not polemic because he never, he never polemicized but, uh, with that, but uh, in the, the famous uh, thing with Lewitt, that's, he was not the one polemic. Could you maybe, oh, yeah. I'm not sure everyone is very familiar oh, yeah. with that polemic. He, so he, he was not the one who started this ridiculous, you know, polemic, but there's one thing that he said about Lewitt, which I always found very funny, is that he, he always uh, thought that Lewitt, um, you know, the fuzzy lines and on the wall and all that uh, was too sentimental and all that. And I, I, I remember telling him, but no, it's a, the wall. It's, a, it's an imprint of the, of the rigosity of the wall. He never believed that. He said, no, 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 Lewitt liked the sentimentality. And yeah, was <laughs> <laughs> but he never accepted his explanation. <laughs> Well, the polemic was kind of silly. It was, it was an ad by, by um, this, the owner of the gallery in Germany, the Gallery of Lewitt in Germany, Gallery M in Bochum, and uh, who published this ad, which I reproduced in the issue here of October, where the three works by three different artists, had, each work had two captions. 
So blah 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 blah. Sold with 1972. François Morellet 1958. Schroenhoven 1951. You know, like three. And the idea was that it was you know that sold with that had basically cop. And it was said how long will yeah. <clears throat> yeah. How long will Sol Lewitt to cop continue to copy the concrete? So, you know, the, the whole polemic went down. And, and, and I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it was a completely ridiculous polemic. It went pretty bad for a long time. And there were letters to, the, to Flash Art. It was really unpleasant. And, and uh, no, no. Well, I. I, I yeah, well, I think that probably at some moment, at some point, probably the, there was the, probably I don't know. I never met Mr. Alexander von Besolt, but he doesn't seem like a very, he doesn't look like a very nice guy. But, but uh, did start a, a question or a question yeah, that is not meaningless. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, I was basically, and I'm, I'm not the only one. It's like. Yes, those things look very similar, but they are very different because they are diff first they're different because they have different contexts. They come at different historical times. They are not produced the same way. Lewitt's image is 195th page of a book through which you can see the progression. You know, it's, uh, they are different, and they look they do look the same. Uh, well, not the same. They do look very close, and they look more the same than they look different. True, but nevertheless, they have different meanings because of all these different sh things, and it's it, one doesn't need the other one to exist, and so you know that's uh, that that's the, the, you just have to learn that sometimes formally things can become very close without I mean, being you know genealogically linked, and so. Um, can we go back to the blue painting for a moment? I think it's the the, the, oh, the, the repartition. repartition can't mean, yeah. So I think one aspect that should be emphasized, what makes this such an extraordinary work, in my mind at least, and I'm not universally thinking every work is equally extraordinary, but this one certainly is in the sense that it differentiates itself quite clearly from other examples like Gerhard Richter's 1024 colors of Ellsworth Kelly uh, aleatory color distribution in the early 50s. So what we reach here, for example, is a quantitative leap that I think is incredibly important, that it is really 40,000 digital imprints, so to speak, that are manually produced. So all of a sudden, the principle and the system and the aleatory operation reaches a dimension that had been previously unthought and unthinkable. Well, this is, this is pretty big, too. Well, I don't remember the numbers. Not, but it's not 40,000. No, right. But so I, the, I don't know how to count very well. Right. But, mm. but the partition into it's, this it's 5, maybe the partition like. into this extraordinary digital detail yeah. is what makes the Morale all of a sudden look incredibly prescient, right? Because it recognizes that chance operations will become operations of increased forms of control and recording, rather than chance operations will remain extreme forms of self-determining liberation or self-determining self-constitution, which as it had been touted initially. I think that is what makes those works so sp specifically different from the legacy of positive utopian chance operations. Yeah. Now, with regard to those, they are, unlike Kelly, Kelly did two works by chance that are systematic. This, the, 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 the one before, one before that, there. Yeah. No, no, no. This one, this one, which is, but, this one was actually painted in '53, but it's based on a series of, uh, of seven uh, collage, each one with a different system. But of course, he couldn't stand it that very much. The first one that systematic is Sen, which is the, the, the black and white you just showed. Yeah, this one. This was a very simple, it's, it has a kind of morally esque quality in the sense that you can see the system. You can see that the first vertical band has, has no, no black square, uh, uh, rectangle, the second has one, the third has, has two, the, 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 you know, it goes like that until it gets to the center, which is, which has uh, no, no, which is all black. Uh, and so the, uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, what, what's random is the, the placement of the black, the black uh, uh, squares, and you know, just by, by, with a dice or something, numbers coming out of a hat, I don't remember. But there, there are only two works in which he carried a system, and after that he, he was, you know, basically got bored, uh, I think, and he was also very tedious. So there's a kind of element of really, uh, I mean, I remember uh, Morale telling me how long it took to do those paintings, 
A year. He worked a year on them, he says. Yeah, it was a year. And the, the triptych, yeah. which we haven't even mentioned, is of course also a red, yellow, blue triptych, right? Even though he distances himself. It's not the primary well, color. That's our doing. Is that? <laughs> no, but no, the way the you series exists in. You cannot not say it is yet another version of the red, yellow, blue triptych. It was a curatorial pitfall. It's all our fault. Really? It, 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 it's really a series that exists in many different variations. Okay. So that was our decision yeah. to pick the three primary colors. Well, he said or close to primary. He said they're also the process colors of printing. Absolutely, therefore, yes. Therefore, I have nothing to do with the yet red, yellow, blue tradition, mm. which of course mm. is slightly dishonest. Right? Well, it distinguishes them. He says that he feels those are two very different traditions. And funnily enough, Lewitt says the same thing. Because he refers to the printing tradition and not the red, yellow, blue tradition okay. when he picks the three primary colors. But I wanted to uh, maybe move on to another, as you call them, Ivana, use and abuse of lookalikes. If we could go to image number seven. Because oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a famous more or less Stella, not Stella. Well, you know, he, he says in several interviews that he actually never liked this work. And he only started to decide to show it because people were mentioning always the work of Stella and all that. And the museum wanted to acquire it. Oh yeah, yeah. But what is but what is interesting is that unlike Stella's system, which is which is not, there's no no system in Stella. It's a, when you look at it, when you, and you should really look at it from close because you can really you cannot see that in in a reproduction. The quantity of blue and red um, in the in the bands and uh, and of uh, uh, blue blue and yellow, yeah, change with the the, the quantity. The lines, the bands are made of except for the the blue the, the center blue one and the center yellow one, and the center red one and the center yellow one. There, all the bands are made of lines of two colors. And the two colors are from the adjoining colors. So it's, it was a, an idea of calculating exactly the quantity of surface covered by a color in order to, to see how you can place uh, blue or, or red in the middle, uh, going from blue to yellow or from blue to, or both time from blue to yellow, actually. So you, you look at the, you, you look at the, the paintings, it's extraordinary really precise the way he did it. And uh, so it was, it was really a, tri a kind of calculation that he wanted to do, almost kind of color studies, and um, it has nothing to do with that. It is a completely, you know, well, it, I, it might look the same. It has nothing well, to do you know, it really so much does not have anything to do with Stella that the reason why mm -hmm. I believe François Morlet did not make a series out of this, but mm -hmm. just one, because he learned about Joseph Albert's work. Oh, so yeah, it's actually yeah. Albers that stopped him yeah. from continuing uh, in this direction. And speaking about Albers, we can go yeah. to see the number eight, eight. because that's a, that's a real Albers uh, one. And once again, oh, is it a good one? Huh? Is it a good one? Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. I, I like this work. <laughs> no, but I'd like and, to talk in, in you know, like, yeah. more and, in detail. But once again, you have exactly the title explaining what it is. And so the idea is that you would never know that it's the same red if you didn't have that it was the central square of the same red in all, all the other all the five paintings if you didn't have them all at, you know there and if you didn't have the title you would not yeah, know the, the title is actually a bit of a shorthand yeah so you have to imagine do you repeat the system yeah. is red on light red red on red red on dark red etc <laughs> <laughs> If we could go back maybe to the, since you just made a pretty good one, <laughs> let's go back to jokes okay. and humor. I noticed that you made a reference um, in one of your essays uh, to Alphonse Allais. Yeah. And you were talking about monochromes and achromes. Yeah. And this is actually, if you could maybe well, explain Allais a bit. Well, Alphonse Allais was this uh, um, write, comic writer who was also in charge of, um, invented a group, late 19th, late 19th century, invented a group called Les Incohérents, and they would make shows, and would meet kind of like, um, I would just, détournement shows in the salons and whatever. So he, he made fa famous, he, he made, they made objects, but also prints and, 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 and catalogs and books, and there are a famous, famous series of monochromes by Allais, 
which is like a, you know a white monochrome, and it's a, it's a maiden's meeting on a, on a, a snowy day. I, I wrote it down oh, for you. Yeah. First <laughs> communion of chlorotic young girls is snowy weather. It's a monochrome. So That's a white one, thing. and then there's a black one, which is of course. Um, I don't have the black one. Yeah, it's like a. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so he, that's, uh, that was, and, and Morellet's father was great, very fond of, uh, of Alphonse Allais, and so that was probably one of his first, uh, uh, you know, interest in literature was, was through this, and Allais was a kind of, uh, you know, he was a kind of Dadaist avant la lettre, a precursor. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so he was a very, you know, a, and, and they, but what's interesting is that his group produced works of art that was not only literature, that was that, uh, and that, that was not that well known, and, and I mean, it was known at the time, but, but the Musée, Musée d'Orsay made about 10 years ago an exhibition of Les Incoherents, and you could see that they, you know, they had a practice, it was an artistic practice. So actually Morley abandoned color quite quickly, and if we were to talk about if not monochromes, at least blank mm -hmm. canvases. Maybe we could take a look, uh, image 32, and works that he started developing in the mid 70s. At some point, Francois Morlaix, or at least that's what he stated, felt that he had done what he needed to do on the pictorial plane and decided to treat painting as an object, as a substrate. So barely. Um, draw anything on the surface and then address through the canvas, so painting as an object, the um, mode of representation and colliding the logic of representation or representing something in painting or not representing anything and the logic of presenting that very representation. The idea was to have two logics getting into an accident and questioning really what the white cube is. Can I go back to the question of humor and oh. Allais for a moment? I think it's very crucial also in the debate of Morellet and his reference to I.K. Bonset and Theo van Doesburg and how much he was attracted to this dual figure which was in, as he said, he was, if I remember correctly, fallen by a disease of Bonset. He, got a, he caught the disease of Bonset and Bonset of course was the figure that in many ways discredited the seriousness and the credibility of the style aesthetics and brought in the dimension of a subversive humorous contestation which is what Morellet does on many levels as well and I'm, the more I read about this humor and the funniness of Morellet I always thought there's also as humorous in performances and jokes always are an indication of discomfort and I think there's this extreme discomfort in Morellet at times where the lack of credibility of what the historical paradigm provides has to be counteracted with a jocular dimension, with a humorous justification. So he knows that the desubjectivization through the system is no longer really an emancipatory act, but it might as well be an act of confinement or an act of submission but he has to still somehow emphasize that it is the system that produces the work and not the artist, when in fact he knows the situation is much more complicated. He cannot completely eradicate himself. He cannot pretend that he's not an artist. He cannot pretend that he's not a subject producing and perpetuating the system. So that schism is often resolved by a relapse into humor or into a funny response, which I think is a very specific condition for that moment of crisis. You don't have that sense of humor, for example, in a Robert Ryman painting from a similar situation when you have a grid that almost looks like Morellet's grid from 1953. There's no sense of humor. There's no discomfort. There's a t total commitment to the historical trajectory of extending the legacy of radical self-reflexivity of monochrome painting. So that, I think, is a really interesting disjointedness between the American and the European model. Yeah. It's true. I, I agree with that. I mean, yeah. No, you don't. Have, you don't have a, even Kelly. You don't have a, no. No, it's very specific. No, it's very specific to to the, the European situation. I think, and and maybe 
in reaction to the intensity of the utopian desire that has been lost, which was never the case in America, or oh, very little, actually. Uh, just a brief moment, but it doesn't have this long tradition. Uh, so that might be the case. You know, it might be, yeah, the you know, revolution won't happen, and certainly not through art, so let's... let's Maybe, I'd, like, two things. To be fair, mm -hmm. if there's humor in the 1953 grid, I think Morley realized it or admitted later. it only 20 years later. Yeah, later, yeah. It's in 1980, they were like, oh, wait, I read... Yeah, the quad text, the yeah. text I text went from back. 1980. Right. So that's only later that he realized that maybe there was something the funny about it. <laughs> so. But I think that the sense of humor, you, you starts a bit earlier than 1980, but... Uh, oh, no, of general, course. Yeah. But if but, we were to talk specifically about yeah. the 1953 grid. Yeah. The second thing is, and... The, you mentioned discomfort, and I think it's... I never thought of it in these terms, and I think it's so true. And there's maybe something of a self-sabotage, sabotaging, uh, almost. Yeah. To what extent can you put or eradicate subjectivity and then remain an artist who still thinks that it's worth making art? Absolutely. And then it's nihilism yeah. otherwise, and he was far from being a nihilist. No, so. no he was not a nihilist, no. <laughs> No. Well, you both have met him, or exchanged with him. Could you maybe tell us a bit about your conversation? Where was that in Cholet? In Cholet that did one so maybe you could explain. I'm not sure everyone knows about Cholet. Okay. Well, um, I don't know much about Cholet either. But you've there. you've been there. I drove there. I visited him. I did a one-day interview for a research project that I was working on. I'm sorry. I I spent a day with him in Cholet, and his wonderful wife. Danielle, they were extremely generous uh, hosts, and we spent the whole day talking, which was my research project at the time, how do you relate to historical avant-garde models? That's what it was about. I mean, I, I talked to many artists at the time. When was and, that visit? Uh, must have been 90, 91. Early and um, I was, I might as well say this, at the time with my wife, Louise Lawler, and she and François Morellet loved each other because they were, had a similar sense of humor. They were unbelievably funny with each other, much more than I, who was the, the cop, cop who asked, was asking historical questions. She, <laughs> he and Louise were joking around, and Louise was taking pictures of the Morellet parrot and their wonderful photographs. And so I was trying, running after them, trying to ask another question about how did you relate to the monochrome? How did you relate? <laughs> How did you relate to the grid? When did you see your first grid? <laughs> so it was like, it was a pretty wonderful situation. <laughs> that was my only, unfortunately, my only encounter. But it was a wonderful what about you, Ivana? Well, I met him several times, not that many times, but several times. The first time I was very young. You mentioned you were barely a teenager. I was a teenager, not a barely. <laughs> what did you say? You were 13? 14 or 15, one of the two, I don't remember. Anyway, and that's, um, I was introduced to him in a gallery, in an opening, and by um, someone that I just met through my family that, that very day, Jean Clay, who was a friend of Morellet at the time. And, and I, we had a long discussion and all that, and I think we corresponded a bit, but I didn't go to Cholet at that time. And, you know, I was, living, I was not living in Paris, I was living in Toulouse, so. Uh, anyway, uh, and then I met him, like, 30 years later. Uh, at uh, an opening at the Pompidou exhibition called Premise, I remember. It was a, it was a completely, it was a non-show, uh, which was basically... It was the, yeah, it was like, they were showing what they had bought, what they had acquired since the opening of the Pompidou, which was actually quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So, and he was there, and he recognized me instantly, and of course I had not seen him like in 30 years. I said, how is it possible? And he said, well, you know, we were very impressed because you were so young. We felt that we had won. <laughs> but typical Morelli fashion said, but rest, rest assured, that didn't last long. <laughs> so it was, a, and then we, we had a, we had a, you know, exchange, you know, several exchange in, in correspondence after that because I was writing this piece that is published in October was actually the first publication was in a, he was a lecturer at the, an, uh, uh, con the Congress, a Congress, an you know, artistry Congress, one of those things that people never read. You know, they, they are the acts oh, of the. Well, yeah. So that completely disappeared in some kind of boring, dusty publication, so I decided to republish it. And, but that was in the early 90s, and uh, I was, that when we, 
communicated quite a lot. Because you were among the earliest. I mean, there has been Lynn Zelewanski and Thomas Machiavelli who wrote wonderful things and they were the earliest in the US really yeah. to pay attention and then it was you. So the last time I saw him was uh, 10 years ago and we, we, we kept co corresponding for various things but I went with my two sons who at the time must have been, well, they were 25 and 20. And um, Morelli was already sick, and he, in, and he, but he was always making, you know, often jokes about that in the typical uh, of his fashion. And he, he said to, to my kids, um, and we were together because, not because I'm going with my 20 year old and 25 year old kid. Yeah, no, no, it was for some family uh, business and wedding or something. Uh, we passed, we, I, I went there just by, almost by chance, and. Um, he, Francois showed them the, all the, you know, the, the studio, and, and, the, and the parrot was already dead, uh, unfortunately. But uh, no, it was things that changed. But he said, you know, you know, the, my work you understand, and my work uh, is functioning the systems that don't need me. So when I die, I decide Danielle will put me in the fridge, and she'll continue to publish this work. And it took of my my kids a few minutes, to, you know, a few seconds to say, this is serious. <laughs> it's typical of him. Typical. Well, we could perhaps look at image 38 to show a more recent example of systems that, because they follow this self-generative, they could keep on existing and being infinite. Because after more rigorous or maybe austere-looking systems, at some point, François Mollet decided to maybe make sure he would never become dogmatic and break away from frameworks. And he had a Baroque period. He even called it Baroque concret, so art concret meets Baroque art. He was actually very impressed by late Baroque architecture, notably in South Germany. And we have here another example of shapes that could be reminiscent of arabesques, for instance, but following, despite the seeming, seemingly free, and you would say frivolous, movement, actually following exactly a system based on the pi number. And the reason why it shows pi in the first place, and that was again way back in the late 50s, is that it was a number, first of all it's called an irrational number, so irrationality was only loved, even though it's logical. It was potentially infinite, and the sequence was there for him to use without again having to make any other decisions. So now that we know the system, and one equal 10 degrees, if you go back, let's say, in the gallery, you follow the rest of the pi sequence, or at least parts of it, and you could imagine for yourself what the work could be. It's, it's so often, with pi, it's often immediate for you think This work is also based on pi 14, the f image 14. Did I send you the diagram of that one? Uh, image 14, no, 14. One, one four. <laughs> but I thought I'd set the diagram. Yeah, this is based on pi. And we can explain if we don't have the diagram, maybe. Well, you try because I, I, I if I didn't have, I mean, I, I tried before the, before I, I got the diagram. I tried for. It took me a long time and I couldn't oh, find you it. You should look at us when we installed the work. It took us like half a day to make sure we got it. Uh, no, it, it's on us because his yeah. system is very clear. Each square is divided in five equal rows. Each is numbered on each side, you know, you know the two axes, from zero to, or, yeah, zero to nine, zero, one, two, da, 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 da. And then you take the numbers, the sequence, here, and this is how, you know, it's like a bataille navale. How is it called in English? Um, you know this game when you gave, battle, is it battleship? Okay, so that's exactly how uh, François Mollet would describe it. Anyway, you I just play Battleship, you get your numbers, and that's how you place your squares. It's, it's and incidentally, the first two squares land on the same, same spot. Yeah. So that's why you only, you have, you see one square, there, there are two. Okay, okay. just imagine there's two squares right there. For those who have not read this, uh, this, this uh, is, uh, I will read you the little quote that he makes in this, which is typical him, which I think is very good. If you look at the result of the four pictures using the first 16 digits of pi, it almost looks too good to be true. Let's first be objective. 
In number one, the two squares end up in the same place and turn into one. Then the two squares end up in a symmetrical position in relation to our diagonal in number two, in relation to two median axes in number three, and in relation to a single median axis in number four. Now let's have a lyrical and cultural commentary. For number one, we could talk about the double materiality of the black square. In number two, we would comment on the elegance of the imbalance, very Japanese. In number three, we could note the sheer classicism, and number four, the sculptural heaviness. And whether we are dealing with triangles, lines, or large surfaces, the results are just as interesting. They all come bearing pseudo-messages. Mondrian could really have yet added much easier when it came to placing his lines and giving them a thickness if he had realized that with this system, whatever he did, he would have won each time. And of course, we had a polemic about that. But, uh, we, I wrote him, I don't look at all. <laughs> <laughs> and he responded. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's you know, I, but when I, without having, knowing exactly what, how you, if you don't, if you don't know exactly how to apply pi, you'll have difficulty. It's <laughs> not easy. Shall we perhaps open the conversation to the public? Yeah. Are there any questions or comments? Please don't be shy. Yes. Uh, Lucy, I think we have someone in the front row. Thank you. Uh, w one thing that uh, I just more like a comment. I'm Flor Morley, the American son of Francois and Daniel Morley. Uh, <clears throat> is that uh, F Francois would do his series and then stop. And even when the series sold well, uh, like the geometries, uh, or with some series like uh, the <clears throat> the uh, the Rolache, uh, at that time the collectors uh, and the museum director really did did not like them, and he was he really enjoyed uh, that people would not like uh, what he was doing. So. This, this is a point I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to say, and, and he kept on doing, uh, and at the end he was saying to his assistant, uh, oh, you know, you, you'll finish the series after I die, you know, and, and he was moving on. <laughs> thank, thank you. Something that should be, uh, as a, a little point to add to what Florent did, one of the things that was remarkable for him, and, and he, he recognized himself that it was the so extraordinary situation with plus and minus is that he didn't have to. He was not an artist. Um, he was an. It was a, you know, he was a Sunday artist for a long time. He was not. He, was, he had a job. He was directing or, or, or helping in a factory of toys, and that was his job. And so he didn't have to sell to survive. Over twenty, over twenty years. Or more. Yeah, yeah. Until the. Until until, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he he was not a starving artist. That's you know. So he had some. There was some envy, probably some part of artists. But you know, he said, hey, you know, you can spend all the time you want in your studio, and I can't. So it was a kind of. A, but he certainly was never at all, never the slightest uh, interest in the market per se. For you know, it was not the problem. You know, he was not. It was not. Uh, he even said that's what guaranteed him his complete to, um, artistic freedom. Yeah actually, not to have to care about the market. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Buchlo brought up something that I think is huge about uh, humor. Of course, we're immediately engaged. But it can come from something difficult, like the fool in Shakespeare. So the root is really a need. It's interesting, it's not, <laughs> it's just funny. Not at all. It's really important and consequential. Not only what it comes from, but what it makes happen, what it provokes, is really, I think, very big and very complex. And for me, this was the best uh, revelation of, uh, I mean, it was a terrific talk, or everything was great, but this was, for me, the point that was really sharp. I thought thank you. maybe to illustrate your comment, thank you so much for it. Is the piece that you see, the neon piece here, which is really a deconstructed circle. You can imagine all those arcs would form a perfect circle. This is dangling from the ceiling, and the artist entitled it Lamentable, like pathetically dangling from the ceiling. So it is both funny and challenging, difficult. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you. This has been absolutely wonderful, deeply enlightening, and also very funny. A good combination. Um, but picking up again on the theme of the funny in Alphonse Allais, uh, it seems to me that the, the, the link between Morale and Allais that you've sketched here has uh, historical resonances or implications. Uh, one of the, the, the ideas that's been in play here is that there's a tension between the early utopian or sincere moment of modernism and a later ironic moment, uh, non-utopian moment. A, a few years ago, the conservators at the State Russian Museum in Petersburg were doing a close study of Malevich's first black square, and they discovered that there was a quote from the exact same Alphonse Allais series you were alluding to on the back of Africans fighting in a coal mine. So that it would appear that this kind of ironic sensibility was actually there at the birth <laughs> of monochrome abstraction. Does, does this change things if, if, if we see Morlay as going back to the beginning as opposed to contrasting with the beginning? Well, I think he was doing both. He was, uh, he was I, I, I don't think that he was contrasting a very early part. I think he was yeah, clearly referencing and getting back to the, the original of the you know, historical avant-garde. I think it's later on he took his distance and became more ironic. I think there's a, I think there's a slight you know, evolution that becomes quite tense at some point in his, in his work. In his, his, in his, you, can, you can kind of trace where the moment, I think the moment he realized that um, you know, the bill system of utter rationality would not work and that you cannot, you cannot, uh, you can just erase data for example from the equation and uh, so I don't think it's to, the thing is to, to I, I don't think it's possible to have uh, either complete opposition or complete continuity. I think there is a kind of arc that goes in his evolution of his career. Yeah, yeah. that's 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 my that always been my in my my feeling about when looking at you know all what he did, and I think that the later uh, his later production is more. I wouldn't say cynical because I don't like the. There's the kind of the, the, the ring of the, the idea. I don't imagine him as a cynic, but uh, but, but since certainly, eh? Realist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's shallow. You want it? It's a wood for me. You know, I, I came for the bad cop. And I don't think he showed up. Um, and I'm a little disappointed. And, I, and I, I wonder if we're all a little bit too charmed by this artist. And um, I wonder if you, you see that there's a recognition here of a historical difficulty. Uh, you know, it might be that he just played it out ironically. Another artist might have seen what Kelly presented and understood that one had to go somewhere else. And in fact, there is an example of such an artist that happened to Richard Serra. And he felt that he, he had to ditch that project. But I, I actually admire Morale too, and I'm completely charmed by him. But I wonder if you could, one of you or both of you could have another go at him. <laughs> I had one question for Ivanov. <laughs> I had one question for Ivana that actually might at least partially answer this, because Morelle is so articulate and speaks so wonderfully about many of his contemporaries and the younger artists. He talks about Karl Andre, he talks about Salawit, he talks about Hans Hacke. He has a lot to say about. He talks about Joseph Beuys, but the one figure that you would expect him to speak about at some point never comes up, which is Daniel Biren because he was right on his doorstep, and Daniel Beren, of course, was doing exactly everything to dismantle what the legacy of that type of Duchampian, Mondrianesque synthesis was pretending to achieve. And that, I think, is a very interesting omission. As we always know, omissions are often more telling than inclusions. And the other aspect that I find very fascinating in Morley is the absolute disavowal of pop art. He was phobic with regard to the legacy of pop art 
for some reason, representation of mass cultural practices is not tolerable for him, or even not tolerable as a moment of reflection, because he thinks and talks about practically everybody. But pop art is not a topic with which he can engage, and that in and of itself is interesting, I think. So um, I'm sorry that I disappointed you with playing the bad cop, but I think... Well, maybe that's where you're yeah. getting the bad cop talking about yeah. Buren, a lovely person, but a bit of a bad cop artist, being very strict right. and serious about the reception and the consideration yeah. of his arts, which I think was a very different temperament or personality. Yeah. Buren typically way. talks about Kelly quite emphatically, how, how important Kelly was for him and how important, yeah, and how important Barnett Newman was for him, but he never refers to Morellet either. So there's a very interesting historical disjointedness. Or Gallic pride. That's what the Americans say a lot. Buren never speaks of Morellet? No. No, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not, I don't know. Maybe Morellet speaks somewhere about Buren. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's true that I, uh, I don't know exactly. I mean, I, I suppose not the same generation. And, uh, you know, and maybe the group, you know, the way the group BMPT became. BMPT he does somewhere. Yeah, he does mention and he kind of liking them. I think they was that they did was good. So, he did, uh, but I think it was mostly in his um, reflection or the thoughts about collaboratives yeah, and collaborative. the relationship with the institutions. institutions yeah. Yes, I don't remember vaguely, but so, but, uh, but, yeah, he doesn't speak about the repetition of the of the bands of, of and as with regard to pop art, I I I, uh, I suppose it's. A, I have no, no, you know, but I, I think it's pr probably really a kind of French prejudice, but uh, prejudice against, oh, okay. uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, or maybe it's just generation. I don't, I have no... Well, you didn't like the Nouveau Realist. Yeah, I was about to say. Right, he makes this one remark about César, yeah. who just did a joke when he compressed his first mm -hmm. car, instead of continuing his real sculpture, right? Mm -hmm. Which is also a very strange statement to make, because if César was ever interesting, it was when he crushed the car, not when he made the sculpture. <laughs> so, Morelli takes a very conservative yeah. position on that level, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, these are generational disjointedness, but it's also a pan pan But it's, it's very interesting, but I think there is also, you know, be because of different context, I suppose that in France at the time, with, with what he wanted to do against subject, all the, the pop would have been read very differently than in America at the time. I mean, I'm thinking about, for example, Kelly was always very interested in pop art, and in fact, he even claimed to have invented pop art, typical. Um, but, you know, the artist with whom he liked to exhibit the most until the end of his life was Roy Lichtenstein. So it's a very different, uh, I think, the, uh, the context, yeah, explain the, grids, the, the grid of lecture would have been different, I think. I mean, I don't have any explanation why he disliked pop art as much, but, well... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There's a uh, point in the kitchen. Uh -huh. there are the house. So, you, uh, so you know, we're all in the way. But Royal Lichtenstein is, you know, quite in. Different direction, but still. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I, I really like the job. Huh. I totally stand. Well, maybe one, one or two. Last question. Well, thank you all so very much, and thank you to our distinguished guest, Yvonne. <laughs>